Good afternoon then. Um, I'm Phil Pemberton. Um, so I'll start with a couple of quick words. Um, there's a lot I could say about this subject, especially about how the navigation network itself works. Um, but I've only got about 30 minutes of this talk, so I'm forcing myself to be quite brief. I'm going to mostly talk about how I reverse engineered the firmware and the hardware, um, which is probably mostly what you will you'll, you'll probably find useful if you're trying to tackle a similar project yourselves. Um, I'd love to, if there happens to be anyone in the audience who's worked on this thing, I would absolutely love to hear from you. My email address is going to be up at the end, um, or you can by all means try and find me at the camp. Um, so, as I said a minute ago, I'm Phil Pemberton. Uh, in my day job, I'm an embedded software engineer. In my spare time, I do more of the same. Um, so I do a lot of electrics and software reverse engineering as a hobby and electronics design as a hobby as well. Um, I've been involved in the development of a emulator for the AT&T Unix PC among a million other projects that are sat on there. I'm an amateur radio enthusiast, which explains kind of why DataTrack was interesting. Um, but also, I, I do a lot of other things as well that are uh, up on the slide there as well. Um, so, quick introduction. Uh, what is or was DataTrack? Well, the short answer is it was a land-based radio navigation system. So you say navigation system, the first thing that springs to mind is obviously GPS, um, which is a satellite-based navigation system that works in a very similar way. Uh, the big difference with DataTrack is it uses land-based transmitters, so big radio masts, 50 watts a piece transmit power. Um, versus GPS, it's quite hard to jam, but also it's quite an expensive system to keep up and running, which is partly why it kind of went, uh, went south, and obviously GPS taking over that market. It was developed in the 1980s by Securico um, after a spate of armored van thefts. Um, so obviously if you're moving large amounts of cash, you kind of want to know where those vans are, where they're going, if they're still en route, or if they've been taken so you can let the police know and uh, hopefully catch the criminals that have uh, done that. But um, later on, it was released to the public in the form of um, a package called Trackback, which was notably installed from the factory in a lot of Ferraris. Um, before I say anything else on that, the current model of these receivers doesn't use the low frequency network anymore. Uh, they're GPS and GSM. Um, what I'm talking about today is up to about the 2010s, so 2011 when it was finally shut down. Um, so this is the receiver. Um, I found one of them on eBay and then the seller emailed me afterwards to say he'd found another five in his shed. So I relieved him of all six of them and then later found another one that had um, the return transmitter on there, so there, there are two radios in these. There's the long wave receiver, which is used for navigation, um, and then a UHF transmitter, which is used to send the location data um, back to the base. And then there's a separate network of these UHF receivers, these base stations dotted around the country that pick up the signals uh, from the vehicles that are transmitting. Only one of the units actually had that transmitter board and the, uh, the program ROM uh, that enables it. Um, so it seems like there's, there's two hardware versions. One can just do navigation and will spit the location out of the serial port every now and again, uh, a bit like a GPS receiver. And then there's the second version, which is the, the stolen vehicle recovery version, the track back version. But it's actually quite a powerful device for its time in terms of CPU power. Um, there's a 10 megahertz 68000, Motorola 68000. You might be familiar with that. It was used in the Atari ST, the Amiga. Um, it's got, um, depending on the hardware version, either 1 to 8K or 256K of RAM. Um, either half or all of it is battery backed, again, depending on the hardware version. And it has a little plug-in card which contains 
the program ROM, um, the firmware that it runs. Um, and it also has a little 8031, which runs uh, as a code processor and talks to the, uh, the radio modem, handles all the UHF uh, transmit uh, tasks, so the 68000 doesn't have to deal with it. So the 68000 concentrates on doing the navigation work, doing all the I.O., and then basically says to the 8031, hey, can you send a location on the network the next time uh, my time slot comes up? Two serial ports and then this almighty hell spawn of a custom ASIC. Um, this thing is the bane of my existence at the minute as far as this project is concerned. It's a TI uh, gate array that was custom designed by Datatrack. Basically, as far as I can tell, they handed the circuit diagram for this off to TI and TI designed them a chip. Um, it does quite a lot. Uh, so it's doing all the CPU interface stuff, all the address decoding, all the CPU signal work. It's got part of the navigation receiver on there. Um, so the way the navigation works, I'll get on to the basics of that in a minute, but you have um, the, the local oscillator that tunes the radio, um, and it also has the uh, phase measurements of a time of flight measurement. It's measuring the time of flight of radio signals to figure out where it is um, in the country, basically. And then just for extra measures, there's some uh, GPIOs, it can talk to um, a serial E-square prom, and there's some optocoupler inputs um, that are on there as well that are used for things like a, there's a status keypad that could be mounted in the cab of the van, um, and the, the guy driving the van could push a button and say, I'm on my break, I'm on my way, I'm delayed, I'm stuck in traffic, etc. Um, obviously there are other companies using this from Securicore, um, so you could have, you know, for instance, on the way to a job, that kind of thing. Uh, so the, uh, the, um, the driver's um, you know, base uh, or office can, can keep an eye on what he's up to, how far he is for his rounds, etc. So it handles those inputs. Um, so it's a pretty interesting piece of hardware. My goal originally when I found this thing was to try and turn it into a PSK31 receiver uh, for the ham radio low frequency bands. Still kind of a goal, but given the way it's designed, it's probably a bit of a, a blue sky goal. Um, so when I first got this, I kind of formulated a bit of a plan of attack. Um, I obviously powered the thing up, see if it works. There's no point putting effort into it if it's broken. I might as well break it down for spares if it's broken. Um, but it turned out they worked. So I went on a bit of a research jaunt, started Googling around, asking people for information, trying to find people who worked on it, uh, names of people who worked on it, found some technical papers um, that covered the system. Um, then decided to go in, read the EEPROMs out, reverse engineered the firmware, did some work on the hardware, and eventually wrote an emulator for this thing. Um, I did want to build a signal generator for it, I've got a Arduino hooked up to a uh, analog devices DDS chip sat on my desk at home. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work. The signal quality isn't quite good enough for the uh, locator to lock onto. And so first step, hook it up to power. Does it work? Turns out it was dead easy to work out the pin out. Um, it's a three pin XLR plug. Uh, it's got ground, which connects to the case. So that's nice and easy to find multimeter to the case, there it is. Uh, so there's two remaining pins. One of them's going to be power, one of them's probably going to be the ignition signal to tell the thing to turn on and off. You obviously don't want this thing running while the engine isn't running because it will run the battery down. Um, cheaters way, connect both of them to 12 volts. It works, um, but it turns out that they're color coded. Red is 12 volts, white is um, the ignition switch. Um, did a little bit of signal tracing. There were two Max 232 chips. As soon as you see one of those, it's like there's a serial port here. Um, the serial port pinout doesn't match a PC pinout, but it turned out to be easy enough to figure out what was going on um, by watching it on an oscilloscope, by uh, 
uh, following the tracks and you know, buzzing it out with a multimeter. And eventually got what's on screen there out of there. So it's, uh, it's booting up, identifying the software version and doing some uh, basic kind of setup. The LP line, incidentally, is it uh, actually records the last position. It uh, found itself in when it powers on. Um, and those are uh, ordnance survey grid coordinates, so the easting and northing, which is, as it turns out, what it uses entirely internally. So there's a command line there. The obvious thing to do is hit enter a few times. And it just says, eh, which is short for, I don't know what that command is. It's your, your DOS bad command or file name. So I figured I'd ask it for help, which they removed to save space in the ROM. It's not going to be that easy. So did a bit of research. Um, it seems like the designers of this system were quite proud of it because there are about half a dozen research papers I found on IEEE Explore and other places just talking about the network, how it's put together, the data that's flowing around, how it works, how it does navigation fixes. Obviously not in the level of like it wants this signal and then it wants that signal, but there's a high level technical overview that's really useful for trying to figure this thing out. Um, and they tell you a lot in those papers. Uh, a lot more than I would have expected for something that is supposed to be monitoring the movements of armored cash vans. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so I dropped a post on a couple of forums and mailing lists, asked if anyone had any recordings of the data track signals. Turned out a few people did. Um, ham radio community seems to like listening into things. Um, but uh, they were mostly recordings of the ham radio bands, but people had done like uh, 200 kilohertz full spectrum captures and got the ham LF allocation plus quite a lot of the whole long wave band. So these contain the data track signals. I've not managed to decode any of them yet. Um, if you're good with GNU radio, I'd like to talk to you because maybe you can help me. Um, but I've got the recordings, I've got the documents that explain what the, the modulation looks like. Um, I know what the receiver at this point, I know what the receiver is expecting to see on the radio input. So I can kind of power it on. I can generate something like that. And it, it kind of locks and then complains that the signal isn't good enough, which is kind of true. Um, but nobody had any actual hardware information on this thing, which is kind of to be expected when it was designed in 1993. Um, or at least the firmware version is 1993, sorry. Um, it's quite an old thing, it's about 30 years, people are going to forget and these documents probably don't even exist inside of the successor company to DataTrack anymore. Um, when it was up and running, the, um, the network was uh, uh, 13 transmitters, covered 95% of the road area of the country with a typical accuracy of 50 meters or better, but a worst case of 100 meters. Basically, what it's doing is uh, time of flight measurement. Uh, you have two transmitters. It, the one transmitter sends a signal, the other one receives it, and then sends its own signal back. And what the receiver is doing is measuring the difference in time of arrival between them. So if you have a receiver on this line here moving left and right, you see that transmitter A or B is getting a little bit closer, and that's the measurement. Um, and you get these. Uh, you see the red and green lines on the graph there, uh, on the chart there, are the, the lines where you get this, uh, the same time of flight measurement. Uh, so what you do is you do the time of flight measurement for um, two transmitters, and then you add a third transmitter, and you've got the green lines versus the red ones, and they intersect. And you find the points where they intersect. Um, you need four transmitters to do this, really. Um, when you have four, what happens is the lines cross over each other and you get sort of a triangle shape that's called a cocked hat. And basically, your receiver is in that triangle. And the, the area of the triangle is the, the navigation error, the measurement error. Um, so it's pretty easy to do this. Um, the catch is there isn't really a 
a way to go from time of flight back to a location, you kind of have to have a, an estimated position and work from that and calculate what the time of flight would be um, and then refine your estimate. Um, it sends a burst of data every 1.68 seconds. That's called a cycle. Um, there are eight, uh, sorry, there are 16 navigation slots per cycle. Um, yeah, no, that's wrong. <laughs> Misread that. Yeah, okay. So there are a maximum of 24 transmitters in the system. There's some crazy timing that goes on to allow that to happen. Basically, the transmitter transmits on one frequency, then the other. Um, and the, uh, the second frequency is used for, the, for something called interleaving, which is how you get the 24. Um, and then these 1.68 cycles, uh, so 1.68 second cycles, you have 64 of those um, in a sequence, and then there's 65,536 of these sequences before the timing pattern repeats. So they all have a, um, a clock value that's encoded in there. Um, and that repeats roughly every 80 days. So from that signal, you, you do the measurements, the time of flight measurements, and you can figure out where you are, but also there's some data carried along there. Um, to do timing synchronization. So I sat down, read the ROMs out. Um, surprisingly, you can figure out a lot not knowing anything about the hardware just by making assumptions. So I read the ROMs out, disassembled them with Ghidra. Uh, so that's the NSA's um, open source um, debugger, this, uh, sorry, disassembler, kind of IDA-like, but um, yeah, it's free. I'm cheap. <clears throat> um, so we can make assumptions about the hardware. 68,000 starts executing from address zero. So the ROM's got to start at address zero. We know how big the ROM is, so we know where the ROM's going to end. Um, this piece of code on the right here um, initializes the RAM in the system. So it's uh, zeroing the uninitialized mem uh, data and copying what's known as the I data. So this is written in C, there's initialized data that's copied uh, from the ROM into RAM to initialize some variables. So we now know where the RAM is in the system. The initialized variables are at the bottom. And we know how big the RAM is because we know how many RAM chips there are. So we've made two assumptions there and found out where kind of the basic hardware the RAM and ROM is. Uh, so that's very useful if you're trying to write an emulator or trying to run snippets of code because now you know at least the basics of what it's expecting, even if not the hardware. Um, there are a lot of text strings in the firmware as well. Uh, function names especially are quite useful. The function names are quite short, but um, it, it still gives an idea of what the structure of the code is like. Ghidra has some problems with it. It turns out the whole thing, they wrote a custom real-time operating system um, but kind of, I think the guy that wrote it might have been a bit of a Unix fan um, because it has threads, mutexes, semaphores, the usual RTOS features. Um, it uses the 68K's supervisor and user mode, so things can't generally trample memory if it doesn't belong to them. Um, but it also has character device support, which seems a little bit weird for something that's running on an embedded platform. Um, the task switching is synchronized against the navigation receiver, and the signal processing is split among several threads, so it's a bit of a nightmare to follow. Um, so I didn't get much further reverse engineering the firmware, um, so I decided to take a bit of a different tack. Um, I wanted to run my own code on the thing, and I was sick of programming EEPROMs and erasing them. Uh, for those of you who don't know what an EEPROM is, it's a programmable memory device, and to erase it, you have to expose it to ultraviolet light for about 15 minutes. Unfortunately, the high-capacity EEPROMs, it's longer. It's more like 30 minutes. Uh, so I was very quickly tiring of that. Built this thing that has a USB port on one side, um, a Xilinx CPLD to do all the logic and control, um, an SRAM, so a static RAM chip that stores the program that we've loaded into it, 
um, and a bit of level translation because this is all modern 3.3 volt logic on the right hand side of the PCB. And if you can see that dotted line, that's literally the boundary between the 5 volt world and the 3.3 volt world. Um, the, th the thing I realized quite quickly was that the CPLD has access to the data and address bus uh, even when the 68K is accessing it. So we can see what the 68K is accessing, which means that we can add an extra debug port by monitoring the address bus. So there isn't a write pin. We can't just write to a port and send a byte. But what we can do is look at the address bus, and if the program on the 68K is accessing a certain address, we send below uh, eight bits of that address to the PC of the USB port, and we now have a debug port. Um, we can send bytes to follow what the code is doing on the real hardware um, without interfering with the, uh, the firmware that's running. Um, because if you start poking at the UART, what will happen is the real-time operating system will realize that things are in a weird state that it wasn't expecting and will then reboot the, the NAV receiver. Um, so it is very pedantic and peculiar. Um, the next step, underneath that massive logic analyzer probes and transition adapters, uh, I swear is a um, transition board which is, is soldered to the top of the 68K with a socket and allows me to quickly connect up the logic analyzer and I can watch what's being executed. Um, and the logic analyzer, so it's a big HP uh, mainframe logic analyzer, can then disassemble what's going across the bus, monitor the bus states, tell me what's going on. Uh, so if you put this together, I can now run my own code on the board using the emulator, but I can also watch what the, uh, the official firmware is doing. Um, if you tr uh, trigger on a chip select, for instance, the UART, um, and then set the logic analyzer to trigger on that and see what was on the bus, uh, what you will see is the address of the UART. Uh, so that's how I found out where that was. Triggered on the interrupt pin, found out which interrupt was being triggered. So now I have enough knowledge there, so I know where the ROM and RAM are, and I also know where the serial ports are, so I can now port something like Tutor or Maxbug, um, a ROM monitor that will allow me to load my own code into RAM uh, and execute that without having to, um, to constantly reload code into the, the emulator. Um, but the ASIC can also generate interrupts for the radio side. Um, there's a way to figure out which interrupt that is too. Uh, you tell the logic analyzer to trigger on an interrupt and then wait, basically. It's, uh, wait for one of these signals to go in, see what hardware is being accessed right after. If it's not the UART, it must be something else. It's probably the radio. So that's how I figured out where that was. Result being, I now, thanks to just poking around at things, seeing which pins are changing states, so GPIOs as well. The chip select trick works on GPIOs. You look for a state change, and then the write that happened immediately beforehand was probably what caused that. So from that, I've got a mostly complete hardware register map with a few gaps. So I know pretty closely what most of the hardware does, what most of the registers do. So I decided to write an emulator, as you do. Um, mostly to prove I understood the hardware as well as I thought I did, but also given the failures of like, my attempts at signal generation, um, the emulator is useful because I can send in uh, raw phase measurements, basically any value I like, I can repeat them as many times as I like, um, and it's always deterministic, it's going to be a fully repeatable test and I can keep changing this data or adjusting it based on what I'm seeing and figure out more about how this is working. Um, I can also add some really quite specific traps in the emulator. So I can look for, for instance, this piece of code executes, then this piece of code executes, and then dump a memory buffer. So I can, for instance, say, you know, grab a piece of data like the phase measurements and see how they flow through the system, see what processing is happening there. Um, and learn a lot more about it. 
Um, and recently, I figured out how the task switching works in the task table for the real-time operating system. So I can even see which task is being executed and trigger, for instance, when um, one of the navigation tasks is, is activated, is, is switched to. So it's easier than reconfiguring the logic analyzer. As powerful a tool as it is, it's a heavyweight industrial tool, and it can be quite tricky to configure. Um, the, the power that has is really reflected in the user interface. Um, I've done an emulator for a 68,000 base machine before. Um, I mentioned quickly at the beginning for the AT&T Unix PC. Um, so I just used the same CPU core I used for that. I know it works, it makes sense. Wrote my own emulator for the UART. Um, it pretends to have an infinite transmit and receive buffer um, with a transmit time of zero. It's not an accurate emulation. It's close enough for the data track firmware. That's exposed to TCP ports, and I just use Netcat to listen to those. Um, it's sat on GitHub. There is a ROM image included with it if you want to have a play with it. Um, and it works well enough that the firmware will run and start trying to lock to the incoming signal. Uh, so it generates a little bit of a signal based on what I know about it as well. Um, but I started hitting limitations in what that was telling me, um, notably about how the radio front end works and what that's expecting in terms of signal strengths. So I finally decided there was no way I was going to avoid actually reverse engineering the hardware back to a schematic. Um, it's a four layer PCB. Uh, it's a quite a small one, but it's quite densely packed. Um, and the technique I ended up using for that was to, uh, to desolder all the components, uh, measure them as they came off, so measure the capacitance of the capacitors, resistance for resistors, where they went on the board, um, and then sanded off the silk screen and the solder mask. So the uh, solder mask is the green coating. Uh, that prevents solder from sticking where there aren't any pads. Um, and the silk screen is the white component text that is telling you which component goes where. Um, scanned the board at that point, sanded through down to the copper, scanned it again, sanded down through the fiberglass down to the inner layers, which took a long time and made my arms hurt a lot. Again, uh, scanned those, stacked them up in, uh, in GIMP, scaled and rotated them to align all the tracks, all the pads, um, adjusted the levels and curves to get a, a really good contrast image, or as good as I was going to get, um, and then changed the color of the copper layers to match. That's basically the color scheme Eagle uses. Uh, so yellow and green for the inner layers, and then red and blue for the um, outer copper layers. Um, and then made the background transparent where the fiberglass was so I could just stack them on top of each other and follow the tracks uh, in the graphics package. So that's what the two outer layers look like. It's a bit of a rat's nest. But what happens is you use the, uh, you start overpainting the tracks you've, uh, or what I did was I, I started overpainting the tracks I'd um, ad, uh, entered into the CAD system. Uh, as I did them, so the more tracks you do, the more disappear, and the easier it gets to, uh, to be to follow the rest of the tracks. Um, so as far as the process goes, I pulled this into KiCad, uh, created all the schematic symbols for the ICs, so there, there I've got the pinouts sat in front of me without having to refer back to data sheets. I know which ICs go where, I know roughly what they're doing, so I add them to the various schematic sheets. Um, started adding pin numbers to the track scan, so I didn't have to constantly figure out where pin one is, which direction they, um, they count. Uh, it just makes life a little bit easier. And as I said earlier, you just follow the tracks and enter them into, into the CAD package. Um, there are some little tricks there. Layer masks are great for uh, saving a bit of time. Um, and being able to go back and check your work. So my uh, current state of play where I am now is I've got a partial schematic of the thing. I know most of the hardware registers. I know how the 68,000 
should be talking to the 8031, but I don't know the address it does to talk to that. And I have an emulator that only emulates 68K. My next plan is to take the recordings I have, and decode them back into um, the data bursts that are at the beginning of every, uh, every cycle, port a monitor ROM across to it, probably tutor ROM, which is sometimes known as Maxbug, across. And that means I can just run my own code on the hardware, put registers and see what happens. Um, it gets a pretty poor, uh, when it locks onto the signal, it gives you a lock quality figure uh, between zero and 100. Zero is perfect, um, sorry, zero and 1,000. Zero is perfect, 1,000 is terrible. It's currently sitting about 930 on the emulator, so it's quite bad. There's, there's obviously something I'm missing. Um, as I said earlier, my eventual goal is to either create a, uh, my own receiver and transmitter and sort of play with the principles of the data track system in the amateur bands. There's just enough in the amateur allocation to pull it off. Um, it's a good learning opportunity for how these systems work. Um, that was a little bit, <laughs> a little bit fast. Um, if you, uh, we're not doing Q and A this weekend, I believe. So, I ask you to hold your questions. If you want to find me at EMF, I'm hanging out with the furries on the top of the hill with the big uh, antenna mast with the lights on it. Otherwise, feel free to grab a shot of that slide. Grab me on Mastodon, Twitter, Telegram. Um, my email address is right there. I'd love to talk to anyone who's played with similar systems uh, in the past, if there happen to be any data track engineers who know this thing and remember some of its secrets. Yeah, here's hoping. Um, or equally, if there's anyone that knows GNU Radio uh, and can help me decode those recordings, I'd really appreciate your help. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Big round of applause, please. Thank you very much, Phil.